Now, now how many of y'all, let me ask, how many of y'all have already started taking down the tree? Anybody take down a tree already? Did anybody not put up a tree? Just check. Oh, no. Okay. We, well, did you, you've celebrated somewhere other than your house, right? Okay. Well, then I give you a pass for that. But no holiday spirit. No tree. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, seriously, you know, we've already kind of the, tr- the, the tree is empty, right? Underneath it. Now that should be true, right? You've got no presents under the tree anymore. Remember how you had this stack of presents, especially if you had kids, like you had stacks of presents, didn't you? And, and every, you know, it seemed like the closer you got to Christmas, the more those gifts piled up. And uh, this morning when you got up and you looked at the tree, it was looking pretty bare, wasn't it? There was emptiness under the tree. The excitement of opening the gifts, the the celebration of the things that you got that you wanted, uh, it's gone, isn't it? Like, you're not going to go home and open more gifts, are you? I mean, maybe you are because some church folks brought you some gifts, right? Because we still, the gifts keep coming, amen? But the excitement of, of the day of Christmas is gone. And, you know, so much of our, our Christian life feels like that sometimes. We have moments of excitement, moments of joy, moments where God steps in and, and we kind of live for those moments, right? For, for many people, that moment, those moments are Sunday to Sunday. It's Sunday to Wednesday to Sunday. It's every time I get to go back to church, I feel God, and then I go back to my life and I'm kind of struggling to kind of feel Him, struggling to connect to Him, struggling to be in the Spirit. And what God wants us to know today is that God has something that is supposed to sustain us every day throughout the year. That the idea of Christmas and the presence of Christmas and the joy of Christmas and the peace of Christmas is something that sustains us and keeps us and carries us. Amen? Hallelujah. So I ask you to open to Luke chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 16 through 21. And this is Jesus' moment right after he comes out of the wilderness and he's going to church, and this is what happens. So he came came up to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Then all the eyes of of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the word of God, and we thank you today that this is the day that we rejoice in you because this is the day that you have made. You have made a day of blessing, a day of wonder, a day of mercy, a day of grace. Lord, surely your goodness is here with us. Surely your promises are yes and amen to us today. Father, we thank you that you have given us a word, and that word is life. And so, Lord, we receive what you have for us today so we may live in it, we may abide in it, and we may embody it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus was born for a purpose. And we just celebrated Christmas, but we know that God promised a a, a people that there would be a king that would be born. He promised a savior to come. He promised a people who had been beleaguered, a people who had had been through many trials and many challenges and many, many terrible moments in their lives. I mean, generations of Israel were in bondage to other nations. Generations of Israel lived in lack. Generations of Israel lived uh, uh, without the blessing of God, without peace, with enemies on every side. Generations of people. And God would speak throughout the generations and say, I'm raising somebody up. I'm going to raise somebody up. I'm going to bring a Savior. I'm going to bring somebody to deliver you. I'm going to bring somebody who in Him is going to be peace. In Him is going to be the kingdom. In Him is going to be the glory. In Him is going to be your redemption. He declared that there would be a king that would come in the lineage and and line of David. David, Israel's greatest king. David, who united the kingdom. David, who destroyed the giant. David, who led worship. David, who recaptured the glory. God said, a king is coming, and he's coming in the nature, lineage of David. 
This king would have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the life-giving power of God, the Spirit that was in the beginning with God and all of creation, the Spirit, the Bible says, who hovered over the darkness. And when God spoke, created life. He said that Spirit, that Holy Spirit, would be given to the Savior, given to this king, given to this baby without measure. And we know that Jesus came, and we talked about this, uh, that he came and he was born and we celebrated with the angels and we saw the wise men come and worship. But then the Bible is kind of quiet about Jesus' childhood, only to stop at a moment when he was about 12 years old. And 12 years old, the family went up to a feast in Israel and uh, uh, mom and dad and the, the aunties and uncles and the cousins and everybody, they left after the feast was over and they forgot Jesus. Y'all remember that story? And Jesus was in the temple. Now, now, if any of y'all have ever left your kids somewhere, it's in the Bible. It happens. Right? Don't feel so bad. The mother of the Son of God did it, okay? But where was Jesus? He was in the temple. He was in church, and he was declaring the Word of God, and people were astonished. And the Bible, Luke goes on to say in, in Luke 2.52, which is actually pretty powerful because it's a mirror of something that was said of the prophet Samuel, but it said that Jesus, the boy, grew in the favor of God and favor with man. Now, how many of you know that's a good thing when you're growing in favor with God and favor with man? Amen? How many of y'all want some of that favor on your life? Right? Now, I want to say that when Mary had that baby Jesus, right? When Jesus was, was about to be conceived, when she was about to have Jesus on the inside, what did the angel say? Favored are you. You are highly favored because God has chosen you. Why? Because Christ is going to be in you. Let me tell you that declaration of favor is for, he, for us today. If you've got Jesus in your life, guess what you got? you got the favor of God on your life. Hallelujah. So Jesus, later on, when he's of age, John the Baptist, his cousin is on the scene. John the Baptist, who has got the spirit of Elijah, who's declaring that the Savior is coming, declaring, get ready, get your life right. Right? He said, make straight your life. Get the crooked areas straight. Get ready, get ready, get ready, because the Savior is coming. And what does Jesus do? He shows up, and John the Baptist is like, whoa, 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 whoa. I can't baptize you. You're the one. And Jesus said, no, it's, it's right for me to get baptized to honor the Father. And so what does he do? He gets baptized and he comes out of the water. And what happens? The Holy Spirit comes in, in a form like a dove and rests on Jesus, symbolizing that the Spirit would be with him, right? And then what does the Heavenly Father do? Say, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And immediately after that, the Holy Spirit says, all right, let's go. And drives Jesus into the wilderness. And, and, and I, I've, I've preached on this, but I, I, I want you to understand that Jesus was pushed, was driven, was cast into the wilderness. How many of y'all know that it's not always fun to go into hard places? How many of y'all know it's worse, it seems worse when it's God that's driving you in the, into hard places? God, the Holy Spirit, drove. That word drove is ekbalo. It's the same word that we use when we cast out devils. Jesus drove out devils. It was forceful. It was powerful. And Jesus was driven to the wilderness. And what did he do? He fasted. He did not eat food. He did not drink water. He was there praying and seeking God's face. He was there listening for the direction of the Father. And he was there, and the devil saw him. And the devil said, you know what? This is my time. The Bible calls it an opportune time. He said, I got him. He's weak. Now, how many of y'all been hangry before? Y'all know what I'm talking about? When you ain't had enough food? And you're weak, aren't you? Right? Somebody says the wrong thing and you go off. Right? You get shaky. Yeah, I've, I've, I've gotten better at recognizing that on myself. I just tell them, well, I'm, I'm getting shaky. I need to eat. Like, that's my warning. I'm, I'm, I'm agitated. Like, I'm not good right now. I might say something stupid that I regret later. So let me find some food real quick. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Think about that for 40 days. The devil's like, I got Jesus on the ropes, man. I'm going to get him now. Right? And he comes and he tests him three times. And we know the story that each of those times Jesus speaks the word of God, right? The devil comes at him with, with a part of the scripture and Jesus says, no, 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 you got it wrong, bro. It is written. It is written. It is written. And then, and then, of course, after the third time, the devil couldn't do anything. And so he took off and the angels came down and fed Jesus. And then Jesus, after the 40 days, after he defeats the devil, comes up out of the wilderness in the spirit and power of the Holy Spirit. And he goes to church. He goes to church, and here he is in church. And, and I want you to catch, if you look at that first verse, just verse 16 again, I want you to look at this again. 
It says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So what was Jesus' custom? To go to church. So if Jesus had a practice of going to church, what do you think that his people should do? Just saying. Now y'all are here and y'all are online, so y'all know, but I'm just saying. There are plenty of people today that say, oh, I love Jesus, but I don't love church. I don't love going to church. I don't want to be a part of the church. I don't want to connect in the church, but Jesus did it. And we ain't better than Jesus, y'all. So it was his custom. It was his practice. Jesus went to church, and he didn't just sit in church, did he? He served. He got up. In this case, he got up to read. He got up to read. I just want to point that out because Jesus was born with a purpose, and Jesus uh, uh, the first thing that he did after he was filled with the Holy Spirit, after he was tested, after he was proven, after he had the purpose of God, he went to church. And he got up and he stood up and he took the book that was handed to him, the book of Isaiah, and he opened up the book and he starts to read from the book. And when he gets to a certain point, he goes. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, 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 the Bible says that when Jesus would preach and when Jesus would talk, like people would be amazed. They would be like, who is this guy? He teaches with authority. He doesn't teach like the dusty scribes. He doesn't teach like the legalistic Pharisees. He teaches and like stuff just starts happening on the inside of me. Right? I mean, you ever have that happen? The word of God comes and all of a sudden you're just like, oh, Oh, I don't know what I got to do, but I got to do something because God is doing something on the inside of me. God is reading my mail. God is speaking to my life. God is pointing his finger on my situation. See, Jesus got up and he began to declare, God has anointed me for a purpose that I am reading this, but I'm not reading this to you. I am proclaiming this to you. This is the very thing why I am here this morning to declare to you what God has sent me to declare. And what did he say? He, He said, I'm anointed by God to do a couple of things. Let's look at all. He said, preach the gospel to the poor, didn't he? I'm anointed to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. He said, I'm anointed to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to proclaim recovery of sight to the blind, and then to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, this, this, is a, this is a chiasm. Now, how many of y'all remember what a chiasm is? Okay, good. Not good. Y'all should remember. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so a chiasm. Now we're going to get into Bible nerd for a second. Y'all ready? Y'all want to learn something? Okay, a chiasm is a poetic form of speech where what would happen is there would be a repetition. Now, often it would be like A, B, C, C, B, A. You ever read that in your Bible where it's like, it starts saying something, then it says something else, and it says a third thing, and then it repeats a third thing, then it says the second thing, then it says the first thing? That's a chiasm. It's, it's a literary device to cause you to remember, to emphasize a point. Remember, often in Scripture, Scripture was first spoken. So repetition helps us remember, doesn't it? Right? It's like why preachers like alliteration. Why? Because it sounds good. It's catchy. Right? It, it, you remember. And so what, we, what, what the, the writer here, uh, Isaiah, is doing and the way he's declaring this, and then Luke is pulling from Isaiah and he's saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to repeat this. We want you to get this. And often with a chiasm, the very idea in the middle is the most important point. Not always, but often. The repetitions are supposed to draw us in and say, what is this all about? Here, it, you know, let's, let's put it this way. It's, it's like that sandwich. How many of y'all like good sandwiches? You might like good, like double-decker sandwich. You got your bread, and then you got your mayo, and then you got maybe got some cheese, and you got meat. What's the main part of that sandwich, that meat, right? What's your favorite meat? Like I like a turkey sandwich. I mean, any of y'all having leftovers? Like, we may have a ham sandwich later, right? Y'all have ham for turkey. So you got the bread, and then you got the mayonnaise or the mustard. You got the, the ham in the middle, and then when you put a little bit more mayonnaise on the bottom, put some more bread on the bottom, and boom, you got you a sandwich. Right? That's what a chiasm is with words. You got your top slice, you got your bottom slice, and enclosed in those slices is a big idea. And this is what we have. We have a good news sandwich right here. 
a good news sandwich. Jesus is, is giving us a message that's enclosed in these little verses right here with repetition. And he wants you to know, I got good news for you this morning. See, the good news sandwich is about healing and freedom. And this is the way the sandwich goes. I got good news. I'm going to bring you healing. I got freedom for you. That's healing and freedom. Good news. Let's have a good day. See, the importance of this message, the importance of the repetition is because Jesus is trying to tell us, this is why I'm here. This is the purpose for which I was sent. I was sent and anointed and appointed by God the Father to bring you this. So let's look at these real quick as we, we go through this. Healing. Healing. One of the main things that Jesus brings is healing. And healing is a clear demonstration of God's good intention towards us. Think about it. God, God offers us promises, right? But, but we're like, I, I just, promises don't mean very much if they're not realized, if they're not manifested. Like, how do I know that someone is going to tell me the truth, or how do I know that I can count on them later if they don't do something now? And one of the powerful ways that God affirms his promises to us is through healing. Because if God can heal your physical body, what do you think he can do with your soul? And I want to tell you that when you read the Gospels and you look in the book of Acts, healing accompanies the word of God in, in so many situations. Sometimes Jesus will just heal somebody and then he'll tell them the good news. Right? Right? Because think about it, they're ready to pay attention now, right? I mean, seriously, if you were sitting there and this guy you knew that was lame for, for 38 years, remember the pool of Bethesda? Dude's laying up there for 38 years. No one can put him in the pool. He's just hoping he can get in and touch the water when the angel touches the water so he can get up and be healed. And Jesus walks up and says, you want to be well? And he's like, but I, I can't get in. Jesus said, just get up. And what did the guy do? He got up. And where did he go? He went straight to church. And they're like, what's going on? That man, Jesus, healed me. A lot of times healing preceded the message because people were paying attention. Look at Isaiah 53. This is an Old Testament verse. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, surely he, now this is talking about Jesus. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed, esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. See, healing is a physical manifestation of a spiritual reality. It's a sign that God means to keep his promise to you. See, this life is a temporary life, isn't it? Right? What is the one thing we can count on? I know we say taxes, but really it's death, right? Yeah, I mean, we're going to throw in taxes because... But, but the one thing we know is going to happen is that we're going to die. Right? The main, the main thing we have to understand when it comes to death is what happens after. And what God has promised us is is a life after death, a life beyond death, an eternal life. But how do we know that that's going to work? Because we don't, when we die, these bodies die, and then what happens? That's the question, isn't it? So how do I know that God can give me eternal life? Well, one of the ways I can know is that he can, he can bring life to my mortal body, to my weak body. He can quicken it. He can enliven it, as it says in Romans chapter 8. He brings life. The Holy Spirit brings life. See, see, healing is a manifestation of a spiritual reality. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that happens physically. It's something that happens emotionally, but it's more than that. It is pointing that there is more to this life than what you know. See, sin destroys our souls. Sin ruins relationships. Sin makes us a target of shame and guilt. Sin puts this burden on us. See, it, sin is not just an action. It's a spiritual condition. It's a, it's a spiritual disease that withers and weakens our souls. 
Sin is like cancer of the soul. It really is. It, it comes in and it demolishes and it destroys and it makes you weak and it makes you sick and it makes you twisted. Whenever God heals someone physically, he's only healing something temporary. You know that? Think about it. If we pray for somebody to heal, to be healed from a cancer, um, are they still going to die? Someday they are going to die, right? Now, we're, we're praying they don't die right now, amen? Right? If someone he gets healed from a headache, you know, are they still going to die? They are still going to die eventually, right? Lord knows not from a headache. Hope not any, anyways, amen? But you get my point, right? And any healing that God does is temporary. It's temporary. It doesn't last. Right? How many of y'all have been healed from something by God? Anybody? And then, and then had another situation pop up. Right? You need healing again, don't you? Right? That, this is the way it works. Our bodies are destined to fade. We're all going to, Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto men once to die, and then after that comes judgment. We know that we're going to die. We know it's going to happen. But those whose sins have been forgiven, those whose souls have been healed, those who are awaiting Jesus return with faith and with patience, those people, though they may die, they'll, they'll live forever. Though their bodies may die, they're going to be clothed, the Bible says, with immortality, with new and imperishable and indestructible bodies. Bodies that are not weak, bodies that don't need sleep, though I like sleep. I don't know how that's going to work. But we are going to have new and powerful bodies. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you tired of aches and pains? I know all y'all young people don't even have aches and pains, but I'm telling you, the older you get, things start happening. Randomly, too. The only pains y'all have right now is growing pains, right? You ever woke up just randomly like, oh, why am I hurting? Yeah, that continues throughout life. <laughs> until we get new bodies. Until we get eternal bodies. Until we put off that which is prone to weakness, that which is disposed to frailty. We put this off and we take on something new, something perfect, something indestructible, something that has its own glory. Jesus was anointed to heal the sick and disease. He was anointed to heal broken bodies and broken hearts. He came to restore us physically and mentally and emotionally so that we can prosper, right? Isn't that what the prayer of John was? Beloved, I, I, I pray that you may prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. God wants you to prosper, but not just uh, uh, not just with material things, but physically. Wouldn't it be nice to physically prosper? Wouldn't it be nice to have no limitation and no lack and no weakness when it comes to your physical body? What about emotionally? Wouldn't you like to prosper emotionally? I mean, wouldn't you like to not be overwhelmed by stress or not be overwhelmed by anxiety or not be conquered by fear or not be troubled by, by uh, difficult things? Wouldn't you like for your heart not to be broken? Jesus comes to heal all of those things, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body, so that you could prosper. I remember, and I may have shared this story, but I remember um, shortly after uh, uh, getting saved, and I went on a deployment and started being discipled, and I started reading books about God and started reading my Bible, and I came home, uh, and we were um, getting ready to go out to the field. And, you know, we were going to be gone for like 10 days, and I didn't really want to go. Any, any military person understand what I'm talking about? You don't want to go to the field? And I was like, I don't really want to go to the field. And then, and then what happened was on, on a Sunday morning, I reached down to pick up my daughter. And she was like two at the time. And I reached down to pick up my daughter, and I felt something happen in my arm. And I don't know how this happened, but I like, I can lift weights. But, I, you know, I tore a bicep muscle lifting up my two-year-old. I went to BAS that next morning. I'm thinking, oh, yeah. I'm getting out of the field. Let's go. I was like, come on. I was praising the Lord, and I went in there. And because uh, I need confirmation, right? It doesn't count if they don't say nothing. So the doc comes in and checks it out. He's like, yeah, yeah, you like duty. I, I started, I, I, I left, and I was like, thank you, Jesus. I'm not going to the field. I get to go home. And the Holy Spirit got my attention. Said, I, I was like, oh, Lord, I said, I know you can heal. But I don't want to go to the field. He said, I'll heal you if you ask me. 
Now I was stuck, y'all, because I was like, I know the right thing to do now is to pray for healing, but I, what I want to do right now is get out the field. I said, okay, Lord, I said, please heal me. And instantaneously, like I knew, I was totally healed. And I, and I went over to one of my guys, and uh, I went to his room, and, and uh, he had strep throat. And I was like, man, I was amped up, though, because the pain was gone. And God, had, I just had a moment with God out there in the little quad from the BAS to the barracks. You know, I'm walking, and God heals me all the way, right in the middle of the road, right? And I'm like, praise the Lord. I go in there, and I'm looking at him like, what's wrong with you? He's like, ah, I got strep throat. I said, bro, God just healed me. I can pray for you, and God will heal you right now. I mean, I had a torn. I just left BAS. They were like, it's torn. I was going to go on light duty and not go to the field. But then God spoke to me, and he healed me, and now i got to go to the field. But he'll heal you. And he's like, all right, pray for me. And I prayed for him. And you know what God did for him? God healed him right there. See, what happened was that healing became an opportunity to declare good news. And that good news led to good things. See, what, what, what God would do, was doing in me physically gave me a, a, an authority, gave me a substance to, to the promise of God. See, I wasn't just saying God's word. I was saying God's word with proof. This is why we need to pursue healing. This is why we need to believe God to do miracles. Why? Because we have an authority. See, when God moves in your life, you have an experience. And if you just have an argument versus someone with an experience, the person with an experience is going to shut you down. You can tell me facts and figures all day, but I know. How do I know? Because it happened. It happened. And this is what healing does. This is what Jesus brings. So I don't know if you're broken today. I don't know if your body is wounded. I don't know if your soul is wounded. I don't know if your emotions are wounded. If you have a broken heart this morning, if you are washing on home because it's a struggle for you to get outside, I'm telling you, Jesus was anointed to bring healing. Jesus was anointed to heal you. Spirit, soul, and body. Jesus comes with healing in his wings. Jesus wasn't just born a baby so that he can live and die. Jesus was born a baby so he could rise up and proclaim to you good news this morning that healing is the children's bread. That by his stripes, you are healed. Listen, you don't have to carry chronic conditions. You don't have to stand in weakness. You can stand on the word of God and you can receive the gift of Jesus and be healed this morning because he is present and his spirit is powerful. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Second thing Jesus came was to bring freedom. Another crucial, critical component of this good news message and a reason why Jesus came to the world is for freedom. Look at Galatians 5, 5, chapter 5, verse 1. Now I'm going to read this from the ESV. This is what the Bible says. It says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. I'm going to read it slow again. I'm going to say that again. For freedom, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For freedom's sake, Christ set you free. Therefore, stand in it and don't go back to being bound. See, before Jesus, we are prisoners of disordered desire. We are captives to corruption. We are constantly pulled this direction and that direction and tormented by temptation, aren't we? Think about it. How many times have you been tempted by something and in your mind you said, I don't want to do this. I know this is wrong. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this until you're already in it. Then afterwards you're like, oh, why did I do this? I hate myself. I hate this. Oh God, can you ever forgive me? God, can you ever have mercy on me? Oh God. See, before we're free, we are bound. We are captive to desires. We are stuck. The Bible says we're held captive to our flesh. And Jesus said, no, I am anointed to bring you freedom. I am anointed to deliver you from the dominion and the control of sin. In Romans chapter 6, this is, this is what he says. And I'm going to read this one from the, uh, the message translation because I'd li- I just like the flow of the language. But you can read it right there in your Bible. Romans chapter 6, verse 14 through 18. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says this. He says, sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under the old tyranny any longer. 
You're living in the freedom of God. So, since we're out from under the old tyranny, does that mean we can live any old way we want? Since we're free in the freedom of God, can we do anything that comes to mind? Hardly. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. But that's so good, I'm going to say that again. You know well enough for your own experience there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. He said, offer yourselves to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act. But offer yourselves to the way of God and the freedom never quits. All your lives you've let sin tell you what to do. But thank God you've started listening to a new master, one whose commands set you free to live openly in his freedom. Jesus came to bring freedom. Y'all know in 1973 in a bank in Stockholm, Sweden, Sweden, there was a robbery that took place. It took place over the course of about six days. And there's a, a phenomenon that rose out of that situation because during that six days, the bank robbers negotiated with police to try to figure out a way to get out alive, right? And after they, the, the police came in, after the negotiations took place, a strange psychological phenomenon happened. And it's, in, in fact, we call it Stockholm Syndrome. Do you know what happened? Many of the uh, bank tellers, the bank workers that were held hostage, they, they joined the side of the robbers. The people that held them captive for six days, the people that came in and held them at gunpoint, the people that came in and were, and, and were there causing problems for their lives, these prisoners said, I, I'm going to side with the, the thieves. So much so that, that some of them actually raised the, they didn't do GoFundMe, this was before GoFundMe, but they did a GoFundMe. They raised money for the defense attorney to defend the criminals. They refused to call them out and testify on the stand. They had taken their side somehow. They were captive. I feel like for some of us, this is exactly what happens to us when it comes to the freedom that Christ came to bring us. We've been freed from sin. We've been freed from the things that we're ashamed of. We've been freed from those old things. But instead of walking in the freedom of Christ every day, what do we do? We go back. Now, I've heard stories of, of POWs who have been so beat down and so, so uh, 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 just crushed in their spirit that when their, their liberators came and opened the prison doors, they didn't, they didn't leave. They stayed in jail. They stayed in prison because they thought it was a trap. They thought it was a trick. They've been so demoralized and so beat up and so beat down. They thought there's no point of going out because somebody's just going to snatch hope away from me again. And I'm telling you, there are many Christians or many people who say they're a Christian who, who come to Jesus hoping for freedom, but because they're still stuck in that old thinking, that because they won't stand in the freedom that Christ has given them, they, that they're trapped. They, they don't realize that they're free. Christ has came, come to give you freedom. You do not have to be bound in sin. You don't have to live under the tyranny of temptation. You don't have to be trapped by desire, dominated and controlled, living that cycle over and over again. Jesus stood up that morning and he read that scripture and he slammed the book shut and said, today I tell you, I've been anointed to set you free, to make you free so that you can live in freedom so that not only will you be healed, not only will you be whole, but you won't be tempted to be uh, uh, and pulled back into that old way of life. That temptation won't have power over you anymore. You know, that's why we do baptism. One of the reasons why we do baptism is because through baptism, we symbolically and spiritually enter into the death of Jesus. Now, why does that matter? Because let me tell you something, dead people don't feel nothing, right? You can kick a dead body all you want. And what, I, I'm, forgive me for the graphic illustration. You can kick a dead body all you want, but it doesn't do anything, does it? You can yell at a dead body. You can talk trash to a dead body. What's it going to do? Nothing. So if you are dead to trespasses and sin, when sin tries to pull on you, what are you going to do? You ain't going to do nothing. You're dead to that life. You're dead to that world. That's not you anymore. The old you has passed away. God is giving you a new one. Amen? One free from disordered desire. One now that, that the things that you yearn for, the things that you desire, they've been put straight. 
You like righteousness and peace and joy. You like love and, and, and the fruit of the Spirit, goodness and kindness and gentleness and meekness and, and mercy. All these things that accompany the kingdom of God, those are the things you pursue now. Jesus came to bring freedom so that you can truly be free. And wherever Jesus went, there was freedom. And he continues to set captives free so they can truly live in freedom from sin and walk in the abundance of peace and the abundance of joy, the abundance of life that associates the kingdom of God. So I want to tell you today that if you're here and you are bound and you are trapped in sin and and you've got a secret sin that maybe no one else knows about, maybe you desperately hide it, you desperately want to get free of it, but you're stuck, you are trapped, you can't escape. It feels like you you are living two lives. Let me tell you something, that Jesus was anointed to set you free and today you can receive that freedom and you can walk out of here a different person. You can stand up and receive Jesus in your living room or in your car, well, not in your car, but wherever you are online and you can receive the Spirit of God and who Christ sets free is free indeed. You can be free today because Jesus was anointed to bring you free. Finally, the last point, good news. This was a good news sandwich. You got healing, you got liberty, but on both sides, you got good news. The scripture that Jesus quoted actually comes from the prophet Isaiah. So we're going to turn back to Isaiah and we're going to look at Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And we're going to read what Isaiah said, and then we're going to remember what Jesus said. Okay? So you ready? Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. I'm going to stop right there. Jesus, when he read this, he was reading Isaiah. And this is what Jesus did. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What did he forget? What didn't he read? What was the next phrase? In the day of vengeance of our God. You notice Jesus didn't talk about vengeance? Jesus closed the book before he got to judgment. Jesus closed the book before he got to wrath. Why? Because Jesus didn't come to tell you about God's vengeance. He came to give you good news. He came to declare the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of favor, the year of blessing, the year of goodness, the year of liberty, the year of salvation. See, that acceptable year of the Lord in in, in the Scriptures is also called the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee was a special designated Sabbath that took place on the 50th year after every 49 years. Every 49 years, the Jubilee would take place. They would sound, and literally it's the, the, the year of the ram. Because they would sound the trumpets, the ram horns. They would would signal this thing. And the year of Jubilee, you know what took place? All debts were forgiven. Now, this is economic debts. This was, uh, uh, this included the restoration of family. So back then, and any teenagers, I want you to hear me. Back then, if a family got in debt, they would sell their kids off to pay off the debt. They would become slaves. It's true. You know, today we call, you know, call Visa and say, hey, Visa, you know, I know I got to work out that, uh, that Christmas debt. I'm going to send my son over here to do some work for you till my debt's paid off. So any family member that was exchanged uh, uh, for debt, they would be restored in the year of Jubilee. Any land that was sold, family land that was sold to pay off debt was restored. Any slaves that were sold to pay a debt were freed. So anyone that came into bondage, if if I said, listen, I don't have the money to pay you, but I will give you, I will give you, I will serve you. I'll become a slave in your house, a servant in your house. On the year of Jubilee, no matter what debt you had left over, it was forgiven. It was done. It was gone. You were free. Matter of fact, they used to 
They used to uh, amortize. You know how we got the loans, 30-year loans and 20-year loans for your house? Yeah, they would say, okay, how many years to the Jubilee? And we'll calculate that from there. Basically, they knew on Jubilee, you was getting free. See, this good news was declared to the poor, right? Didn't he say, I come to declare good news to the poor? Those who had debts they could not pay. Anybody got some debts they can't pay? Now, maybe you say, I know I'm good financially, but let me ask you something. What about spiritually? What about emotionally? You got some debts you can't pay. Some things you said you can't get back, you can't make right no matter how hard you try. Right? I mean, you got some things in your life that no matter how hard you've tried, no matter how hard you work, you can't fix it. I'm telling you right now, there's not one of us in this world, not one of us in this room, not one of us uh, that can pay the debt that we've incurred through our sins. But Christ came to rescue us from bondage, from rescue us, to rescue us from this evil age and pay the debt of sin. He came to declare good news. Your debts are forgiven. This is a year of favor. Instead of judgment comes blessing. Instead of cursing comes blessing. Instead of, instead of pain and sorrow comes goodness. And, 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 and instead of works and effort comes grace. You know what grace is? It's unmerited favor. Jesus said it another way in another sermon. He said in Matthew 5, 1, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus came to declare good news. And notice, he didn't talk about the day of vengeance. Now, I also like that too. I, I love the spe specificity of God. There's a year of favor, a day of wrath. Aren't you glad that we don't, we don't experience a year of wrath and a day of favor? There's a day of judgment. There's a year of favor. Now, when Jesus chose the text, was there a mention of law? Was there a mention of rules? Was there any requirements? Any regulations? No, he, he, what did he do? He stood up and declared good news. He spoke good news. Why? Because with Jesus, it's good news before good advice. Before he can tell you, get your life right, he's going to tell you, I'll make your life right. Amen? Before he shows you how to live and how to do things right, he's just going to say, listen, if you come to me, that's the starting point. Come to me and I will bless you. I will give you healing. I will give you freedom. I will give you favor. This is the year. Jesus comes with good news. He comes to heal broken spirits, broken hearts, broken bodies. He comes to free us from the tyranny of sin, from the prison that we create from our failures and mistakes, from our own disordered desires that want the wrong things. Christ has come to set us free. And Jesus ultimately comes to tell us the good news that He's paid the price, that our debts are forgiven in Him, that the things we want right that we can't make right, He can. He's good for it. That restoration is ours, that no longer do you have to live in bondage away from the blessing and, and the goodness of God, but now you can be restored to the family of God. Now you can be whole again. You can find your place and find your purpose in the kingdom. You know, Christmas is over. But God's blessings are new every morning. The only challenge that we have today is, is to receive what Jesus offers. See, if you don't receive what he's promised, it's no good to you. Good news is not good news if you're unwilling to receive it. Amen? See, the good news of Jesus has the power to deliver us and heal us and save us to all who believe. When God became flesh on Christmas morning, He came with a purpose. And though He had been speaking of centuries, to, throughout the centuries to people and making promises through the prophets, He spoke to His people through the prophets and to the world through His people. When He came on Christmas morning and when Jesus uh, uh, was born in the flesh. 
he came because his, his message was so important that he had to say it himself. God didn't leave it to someone else. God said, I come to save the world myself. Jesus came to save. He came to heal. He came to deliver. He came to redeem. And he came to declare this is the year of God's favor, the acceptable year of the Lord. So if you receive that good news, it will change your life. If you receive what God has for you, it will change you inside and out. See, we are supposed to embark on a, on a lifetime of transformation when we encounter Jesus. Every time we turn around, we'll find his blessing and his goodness. And as we're changed, we tell the world, and what happens to the world? The world gets changed. So we're trying to change the world without God, and that doesn't work. But if we let God change us, we'll change our world. So I want to ask you real simply, will you receive the good news today? Will you recognize that this is the year of God's favor? For, for anyone who will receive, healing is yours. Freedom is yours. Forgiveness is yours. Now, as we close and as I finish, I want you to think about this because, because sometimes we're, we, we leave the, the great day of Christmas and, and, and maybe the holidays, and then we have to go back to life as normal, right? right? I mean, how many of y'all already dreading, you know, going back to work? We got holiday vacation. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're on holiday. We're enjoying our time off with family. We're doing what we want. We're, we're blessed. We're happy. And then we're like, oh, man, all this is going away. I have to go back. I have to go back. I want to tell you today, Jesus says, no, you don't. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the year where you step into favor. This is the year where you walk in healing, total healing. This is the year where your broken heart gets mended. This is the year where you walk in freedom. This is the year where that sin that kept cropping up doesn't crop up anymore. If you believe, if you step in, this is the acceptable year of the Lord. And this is yours if you choose it. Amen. So I want to pray. I want to give us an opportunity to respond to God. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit a simple question like we like to do. Lord, what are you saying to me? While you do that, I want to I pray. So, Father, I thank you that you are telling us that you came for a purpose, not so that we could go back, not so that we live the way we used to live, but so that we can step into favor, that we can walk in healing and wholeness that we can enjoy forgiveness and restoration. Lord, I don't know what area that each one of us needs to receive today. Lord, for some, they need physical healing. Lord, we have family members in the church that are, that are uh, uh, facing COVID right now or facing some other serious illness. Family members that are, or friends that are dealing with strokes. Friends that are dealing with diabetes and high blood pressure things like COPD and other challenges. Lord, they need healing today. Lord, there are some people that are dealing with broken hearts. It's kind of like that Christmas song that I don't know how it became a Christmas song, but where the person last year gave them their heart and then they took it away. Lord, I pray that for those that are brokenhearted, who have experienced a relational relational pain, or that you would heal them. Or that could be with a family member, that could be with someone else. Or for those that are just emotionally broken, just been worn down by this last couple of years, by isolation, Lord, I pray that you would heal their minds, deliver them from anxiety and fear. Lord, I pray for those that are stuck, those that are bound, those that are trapped, those that seem to not be able to break out of the cycle. They'll be good for a while and then they'll go back to sin and they'll be good for a while and they'll go back to sin. Or let freedom come today in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for those that, that have a debt they can't pay, a sin debt. That they've not received the goodness of God, the good news that they can be forgiven and not only forgiven, but, but saved and brought into, adopted into God's family. But I pray that today would be the day that they receive. Or whatever category, and maybe we have multiples that we have to 
we have to get. Lord, let us, let us walk away with great boldness and great confidence, knowing that this is the acceptable year of the Lord, that this is the year of God's favor for our lives, that this is the year of healing for our lives, that this is the year of freedom for our lives, that this is our year. We give you the glory for it and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's give God some praise. Hallelujah.